Okay, we're going to finish with the Mexican history today. When we left off last time, uh, we talked about the Constitution that Mexico drafted and adopted in 1917. It's the Constitution that they still live under and work under today. And as we talked about, it basically set up a democracy. You have an elected legislature, an elected president, you've got a separation of church and state. So on paper anyway, it looks like Mexico is going to be a democracy much like ours. And if you remember before 1917, there was a lot of fighting back and forth about who was going to be in charge, and a lot of instability. And so what they set up in the Constitution is one six-year term for the president. And so no one person could be there, and there's no reason to fight because you knew whoever was there was only going to be there for six years. Nobody could be there more than six years. And so not long after this constitution was written, the uh, elites, the top people who had sort of been fighting each other for power, formed a political party called the PRI. PRI. And all the important people were in it. And so because of that, that allowed them to keep power and to share power, and one would be president for six years and somebody else for the next six years and the next six, six years and so on. Um, and the PRI is going to basically dominate Mexico. Mexico is going to be a one-party state from about 1920 until about 2000. So in, uh, on paper, Mexico is going to be a democracy in the 20th century, but in truth, the PRI literally wins every election at the national level, at the local level, etc. And so it's all about the PRI. And we're going to talk later about how the PRI did this, how they stayed in power so long. But um, for now, just know that it was a one-party state until 2000. Um, one of their more important presidents is a man named Cardenas, who was president from 1934 until 1940. And uh, Mexico is going through sort of a depression, just like we are during that period. Um, if you remember our president, Franklin Roosevelt, his answer to that, to get the economy going again, was a bigger government, more government programs. And Cardenas' answer was sort of the same. So he did, um, he went even a little further than FDR did. One thing that he did is he nationalized industry and he formed Pemex, which is the Mexican government's oil company. Um, if you remember, Mexico owns everything under the ground, including oil, and so the, com the uh, company that administers that is run by the government, and it's called Pemex, sort of like the NNPC we talked about in Nigeria. And so he kicks out all the foreign oil companies, takes the oil, and forms um, Pemex, and nationalizes other industries as well. He does a lot of sort of public works programs where the government is doing things like building roads, building schools, which is similar to what FDR did uh, during the Depression with the CCC and different agencies like that. He takes the land from some of the wealthier people and gives it to the poor uh, to let them farm their own land and own their own, uh, their own land. And then he um, he also has a system called corporatism, C-O-R-P-O-R-A-T-I-S-M, which is sort of different from pluralism with our interest group system, where interest groups are private and then they ask the government for things. There are certain interest groups that are favored by the government and sort of have a seat in the government and get to sit in on the meetings. And for him, those interest groups were unions and a group representing peasants, etc. So basically, the common man had a seat in the government under Cardenas. And then the last thing that he did, we're going to call import substitution, which is basically a policy of high tariffs. Um, so it cost a lot to import goods into Mexico to sell. It cost a lot to uh, probably to export goods out of Mexico. And what this did is it promoted Mexican industry. He wanted products to be made in Mexico, not elsewhere. So by placing those high tariffs with import substitution, 
He promoted Mexican industry and building up Mexican industry. So in a lot of ways, he's the opposite of Diaz, who invited in foreign uh, companies, FDI, low tariff, things like that. And so he's only there uh, six years because that's the rule. But he is a type of politician that in Mexico is known as a politico, who favors big government, more government programs, more government control of the economy, etc. The opposite of that in Mexico is a technico. This is more of a small government guy, um, lower tariffs, fewer government programs. So if Cardenas is a politico, Diaz was a technico. And what's going to happen is even though the PRI is in power for 80 years, uh, power tends to swing back and forth in the PRI like a pendulum is swinging back and forth. And for a while, the politicos will be on top and then power will swing back to the technicos and back to the politicos, back and forth. And if you remember in China, we said there's two different groups in the CCP, the princelings and the populist, and they're both uh, Communist Party members, but they've got different views about business and the rural areas, etc. Similarly, in Mexico, there were two groups in the PRI, politicos and technicos, but they were both PRI members. Um, because if you wanted to get anywhere in Mexico in the 20th century, you had to be in the PRI. So PRI is in power for most of the 20th century. Um, and so we're going to look a little bit at how things started to eventually fall apart for them. Um, and we'll talk more about how the PRI you know, stayed in power. But uh, Mr. Fluharty grew up in part in Mexico and has a lot of family who grew up there and some still live there. And he could tell you a lot of stories about the PRI and what they did to stay in power. Um, but 1968, uh, Mexico hosts the Olympics, and a lot of people are not happy about that because why is the government spending all this money on the Olympics when they could be you know, helping the people, building roads, etc.? So a lot of protests start, and that's really the first time that Mexicans have sort of stood up to the government. Um, much like Tiananmen Square, some of those protesters um, get shot and killed, um, but then others are sort of invited to join the government and uh, to work within the government to get what they want. But that's one of the first times that the, uh, the people stand up to the government. 1970s, the economy really takes off and things are good. And because of that, Mexico uh, borrows some money. We saying, hey, we'll have no problem paying it back. We're gonna go ahead and borrow some money to do some things. And then in 1980, the price of oil drops worldwide. And so when Pemex sells its oil, it's not bringing in as much revenue as it thought it would and um, the loans are starting to come due, and so Mexico's in trouble. And in 1982, uh, Mexico is going to take a loan from the IMF. And the IMF is the International Monetary Fund, which is kind of like a world bank, is where countries go to do their banking. Mexico took a loan from the IMF to pay back the other loans from the 70s but there were some strings attached to the loans. And so what Mexico had to do to get the loans is they had to privatize some of their industries. It had to cut spending, cut government spending. And, and then pay back, use some of the loans to pay back the, the debt that it already had. And so, um, a lot of Mexicans are not going to be happy with the outcome of this because if you privatize, that means a lot of government employees are going to lose their job. If you cut spending, you're going to have to cut some social programs that people have come to rely on. If you're paying back debt, that's money that's not being used directly on the Mexican people. So similarly to what happened in Greece over the last 10 years, where Greece has all these loans they need to pay back, but when they try to pay them back, the people get upset. The same thing happened here, and so in the 80s, people start to get irritated with the PRI because they are not seeing the same level of spending by the government on them that they've become used to. Um, add on to that. Mexico City has a big earthquake in 1985, and the government doesn't respond very well. 
and the PRI takes a uh, publicity hit on that as well that makes them less popular. And a lot of the people in Mexico City start to do it themselves and they start to think, why are we relying on a PRI? You know, we can do sort of our own thing. And so what's gonna happen starting in the, the mid 80s, I should say mid 80s, up until the late 90s, At a smaller level, some other parties start to win some local elections, which had never happened before. So slowly, some other parties are starting to gain traction. Eventually, they start to win some legislative seats um, as well. And then 1994 is a big year for Mexico as well. Um, in 1994, the economy goes down again. And so they have to take loans from the US. Uh, to bail them out because our economies are so intertwined if their economy goes bad it hurts us so we loan them some money um, as we learned about in the scavenger hunt there's kind of a low-level revolution in the south by some indigenous people who live in a state called chiapas who are not happy with what's going on in the government they're not getting the same support and then also um, in 1994 Something happens that's going to have a big effect on Mexico for the future. Um, the North American Free Trade Agreement, or NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement is signed in 1994. And what that's going to do is it's a free trade agreement among the US, Mexico, and Canada. So kind of the opposite of what Cardenas was doing, no tariffs to uh, bring goods in from the U.S. or Canada into Mexico, which is going to increase imports into Mexico, but it's also going to increase exports from Mexico to those other countries. And so what's going to start to happen, much like you've seen in Asia, is Mexico starts to build a lot of factories and buildings in Mexico that are then shipped to the U.S. and to Canada and sold there. And so it makes Mexico more of a manufacturing economy than it had been. We're gonna get more into NAFTA later. That's also signed in 1994. Um, but ultimately, for a lot of reasons, the people are losing faith in the PRI. The PRI's um, losing their grip. And so what happens in 2000 is for the first time, Mexico elects a president who is not a member of the PRI. Um, I don't know why I went 1994. Um, uh, the president is named Vicente Fox. He's a member of an opposition party called the PAN, uh, which is kind of a right-wing conservative alternative to the PRI, which has developed similar to sort of our Republican Party. Um, so he's elected in 2000, first non-PRI president, which is kind of a big deal. Um, a couple of things that have happened since then. Um, real quick, actually, let me right over here. Uh, president is elected in 2006, who is also from the PRN, his name is Calderon, C-A-L-D-E-R-O-N. And what he's mostly known for is using the military to fight the drug cartels. He said, we've got to get this under control. Instead of relying on the police, I'm going to rely on the military. It caused a lot of deaths, a lot of violence, without a whole lot of... Um, success against the drug cartels. Um, 2012, there's a president named Peña Nieto, who's PRI, um, with not a whole lot of notable things we're gonna talk about there. Um, but going back to 2006, Calderon beat a candidate named uh, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador. Uh, A-M-L-O, AMLO is what they call him. In a very close election in 2006, AMLO barely lost um, he claimed that there was fraud, he was cheated out of the election, he may or may not have been right, it was very, very close. Eventually, the Supreme Court decided Calderon had won, Calderon took the inauguration, swore himself in. Um, AMLO did the same thing, he refused to admit defeat, he also swore himself in. So for a time in Mexico, you had two people who were uh, both acting as president and both had appointed a cabinet. Eventually, AMLO gave up, but then in 2018, AMLO came back and became um, president. 
he is from a party called Morena, M-O-R-E-N-A, um, and they are a left-wing alternative to the PRI. Um, in some ways, Lopez Obrador is a lot like Trump. You never quite know what he's going to say or do at any given time. Uh, he's not a traditional politician, but if Trump is on the right-wing side, AMLO is on the left-wing side, uh, we're going to stop there.